You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have uh, Assistant Professor Alan Davis at Johns Hopkins. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, exploring the acute and then the persistent effects of uh, psychoactive substances. So, Alan, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Thanks. I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your research? What are you working on? Sure, yes. Yeah. So, I have worked for the past few years at Johns Hopkins and uh, our newly found uh, or newly titled Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research. I'm a clinical psychologist, so I both work as a guide of uh, psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy for people with depression, uh, as well as uh, a researcher. So I do uh, publishing and, and other types of studies there. Okay, so the uh, what is the research? So is, is it primarily people with depression and using psychoactive substances to get them over chronic depression, or what, you know, what's how do you encapsulate it? What's what are you working on? So we use primarily psilocybin, which is the active ingredient, active psychedelic ingredient in magic mushrooms. We use that mm -hmm. as an adjunct to therapy for people with depression and addiction. And coming up here in the next few years, we're going to be looking at that as a treatment for people with PTSD and anorexia. Um, but the, the program that we uh, have engaged with there at Hopkins has has been around for about 20 years. We started looking at uh, the use of psilocybin in healthy volunteers just to get a better sense of its acute effects and its safety. And then eventually we were able to start applying that to clinical populations to see if it was helpful with depression and addiction. So is there any, uh, you know, whether they're peer reviewed or not, or, you know, double blind studies? I mean, so far, what does it look like? Does, uh, you know, the psilocybin affect people significantly that have depression and how? Yes, so all of our studies are, are peer-reviewed uh, clinical trials and uh, have been approved through IRBs and FDA and DEA. And our most recent trial with depression is just wrapping up, and so we haven't published those findings quite yet. But the results are showing that after the treatment is complete, about half of the people in the study no longer have depression. Their depression is completely gone at one month after the treatment. And we're following up with them as, as far as 12 months out to see if that lasts. And so far, the three- and six-month time points, we are seeing that uh, a good number of those people still uh, are, are without depression. So what is the treatment? Is that one dose of uh, psilocybin or is it multiple? Like, What does the treatment look like? So we give two doses of psilocybin on two separate days. Those days are full days in the clinic with uh, either myself or one of our other primary guides as well as in a, a co-guide. And then we also have about eight hours of therapy before the experience to help prepare them for psilocybin, as well as therapy uh, in between sessions and after the second psilocybin session. So in total, it's about 12 to 14 hours of psychotherapy plus the two days of psilocybin. Well, what, what's involved in the psychotherapy? Why the preparation? What do you have to do? So the reason that we have uh, so much preparation is because we're giving uh, moderate and high doses of psilocybin. These are doses that are are usually much larger than what people would have in, uh, for example, a festival environment or even at home. Now, certainly some people seek out, you know, high dose psilocybin experiences on their own, but, but we're giving pretty high doses. So we want to make sure in that therapy that we are doing what we can to build a solid connection with the person, that they feel like they can trust us and trust the environment, and that we have a pretty good sense of the kinds of things that might come up on their session day so that when they come in for their first psilocybin session, they are as prepared and ready and as trusting as possible because there are a lot of things that can come up that day, especially with people who have mental health problems. And we want to make sure that, that everyone's prepared for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So it, when you say depression, what kind of depression did the uh, study participants have? Like what were the requirements? So 
So yeah, for depression, this study, length. Mm-hmm. for this study, everyone had to have at least moderate or severe depression, and most of them had had depression for about two decades. They had all, uh, almost all of them, had used several other types of treatment without much effect. They had tried medications. They had tried psychotherapy, and they had not found relief from their depression and had been living with that for a very long time. So most of these folks would be considered as treatment resistant, meaning that they just didn't have, you know, a positive effect of what we already have available for treatment coming into our study. Okay. And did you look at what, like, what experiences they had during the first and second sessions? And was that different? Like, what are some of the, can you get any, you know, anonymized anecdotes that people gave, uh, during or after the two sessions? So some of the things that we know about what makes these experiences therapeutic for people are things related to uh, a mystical experience or an experience where people feel as though they um, are more connected to the universe, more connected to other people, more connected to themselves, and they develop that connection. They have that experience of connection during the psilocybin experience. They also report having experiences of gaining insight, uh, which can be a new awareness or a discovery about some new information that they previously weren't aware of, and that can take the form of new information or awareness about their jobs or their relationships or past difficult emotional experiences that that they've had. And it's the combination of these mystical and insightful experiences that seems to be related to the uh, effects that we're seeing. We also did for this depression study uh, neuroimaging before and after the treatment in order to get a sense of whether or not there were actual changes in the brain activation um, and whether or not that related to the outcome. What we found is that there were significant changes after the treatment in this area of the brain that's responsible for processing emotion. And then that change, that improvement of their ability to process that emotion uh, actually related to their decrease in depression. So we're seeing both acute uh, self-report experiences that seem to be helpful, as well as changes in brain functioning that seems to be helpful. And what about the difference between the two sessions? Was there a big difference? Like why two sessions and what happened after one versus after number two? So I would say that the two sessions, are they differ by dose. So in the first session, we use a slightly, uh, or actually slightly a little bit, uh, about, you know, two-thirds the size of the dose that we use in the, in the what we call the high-dose second session. And one of the reasons that we do that, start off with a smaller dose, is that we want people to get, you know, some experience and, and to kind of dive in, but, you know, not give them the full big dose uh, in the first session in case there are any challenges. Essentially, it's kind of starting Starting off with a little bit of practice, a little bit of getting comfortable. Um, not to not to say that people don't have meaningful experiences in that session. They do. It's not a small dose, uh, but in part, it's to kind of you know grease the wheels for the higher dose session. We don't see a lot of differences in terms of. Um, The effect, it seems to be the two sessions together. These sessions also occur pretty quick uh, in terms of uh, in terms of how far apart they are. They're usually only about two weeks apart. Uh, And so uh, some people do start feeling better after the first session, but we see a bigger effect after the second session. Mm, Okay, makes sense. Again, what are some of the so people you said get insights? I don't know what kind of insights are they getting? Can you characterize it at all? To give you an example, we had someone recently who uh, was really struggling with uh, social anxiety in addition to depression. And so they were really struggling to uh, to work and to feel like they could go to work and, and be successful. And in fact, they would they would get to work and their, their social anxiety and depression would be so um, intense that they would end up calling out sick and, and having a lot of difficult problems succeeding in that environment. And during this person's psilocybin session, they had this experience of becoming a large dragon. And in this in this kind of visual uh, uh, adventure, they flew in as a dragon to their work environment and proceeded to eat every single person in their job and then burn it all <laughs> to the ground. And this person came out of that experience feeling empowered. And when they went back to work, they came in and said to us, you know, I have zero anxiety anymore at work because how can you be afraid of people you can eat? <laughs> that's pretty cool. Huh. Yeah. So that's those kinds of like powerful visual experiences coupled with these insights, these new understandings of themselves that seem to produce change. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's excellent. Hmm. Um, how would this manifest in a, uh, you know, an approved medicine for people? You think it would be the native mushroom itself that would be approved or 
it'll be a medicine that isolates certain parts of the psilocybin. Like, what's, what's your vision for the future? So the vision for the future is that uh, hopefully in the next few years, FDA will have enough evidence to be able to determine whether or not it should be made available to the public for treatment of depression. Uh, we're going into this fall, starting the last multi-site uh, trials, which means that it's, it's going to be at Hopkins as well as I think seven or eight other sites around the country. And this multi-site, you know, large numbers of people coming into the study is the type of data that FDA needs as a final step to make sure that it's uh, something that can be approved. Once it's approved, it will be approved as a synthetic drug, so it won't be the uh, the um, the mushrooms. It'll be a synthetic uh, capsule, if you will, of uh, the psilocybin, and it will likely be administered in specialty clinics around the country that are specifically uh, trained and accredited for this type of treatment. So it'll probably uh, be uh, somewhat different than the types of medical settings that currently exist. Oh, so you don't think it'll just be, uh, you know, some psilocybin ground up, put into like a pill format and ingested? It's unlikely that in terms of the medical use of this, it will almost certainly have to be a synthetic drug that's, you know, maintained and controlled in terms of the dosing and the purity. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't other efforts. You know, certainly there are efforts in in Colorado and California and other places to decriminalize mushrooms and to work towards uh, finding the availability for uh, the general public, not necessarily looking for a clinical experience, but just wanting to experience mushrooms on their own in a legal environment. And certainly those efforts will probably continue and, and maybe be available at some point in the future as well. But in terms of the medical use, uh, we're talking about kind of a prescription that will be uh, that'll have to be prescribed by a physician or a psychiatrist and administered by a psychologist, social workers, and counselors. Well, which which scenario do you think is more likely, or do you think both will happen? I think, given the well, if we look at the you know the marijuana movement across the country, it, you know even with all of the states that have already approved recreational and medical use of cannabis. Uh, the federal government still, you know, has not really made much progress in doing anything at the national level. So I doubt that there will be, you know, anything different in terms of uh, the use of psychedelics in recreational settings. Um, I think that what's more likely to happen is that FDA will um, have enough evidence to to hopefully approve it as a medicine first. And when that happens, then the DEA is going to have to decide whether to reschedule it because as it's currently scheduled, it would not be able to uh, be uh, prescribed. So they um, uh, they hopefully will reschedule it into a less restrictive um, uh, schedule, which would hopefully pave the way for other types of efforts to uh, to decriminalize and to and to move that effort forward as well. So first step is maybe um, move it to a less. What would you call it? I guess you know, how would you describe it? You'd uh, reschedule it at a yeah, lower reschedule tier. It. Exactly. To put it in a lower tier where it's less restrictive, and usually that's associated with like less penalties for uh, uh, for people using it and having it. Um, and, you know, hopefully in general, you know, the more evidence that we publish that shows, you know, that it's safe, that people um, have safe experiences in the right types of settings with the right type of preparation, um, and that people can actually we see a benefit with that, the less argument that the government can make that it's actually dangerous. Mm, yeah, that's true. So that would so yeah. In in order, what do you think is likely to happen? Well, I think you know the best sense of it is that you know right now there's really no predicting what the federal government's going to do at any given moment. <laughs> um, mm. So I think that luckily we have you know a couple more years, uh, and maybe hopefully that means a couple you know changes in some of the um, the you know, the composition of our federal government and the people that are in those agencies. Uh, what we do know is that FDA is, uh, is, is already, you know, supportive of this effort. Uh, the people at FDA have invited us out several times to talk about um, how best to see this work forward. They've actually designated psilocybin as a breakthrough therapy treatment for treatment-resistant depression. And basically what that means is that the FDA thinks that the current evidence so far is so compelling that they actually want to make sure that they're doing everything they can to see this um, through the process as quickly as possible. And so uh, FDA seems to be pretty uh, pretty much behind the effort. Uh, but again, they will need this last bit of data before that can that decision, final decision can be made. So what's the timeline on this, do you think? 
I think the best guess that I have would be we're probably two to three years away from having this data from the big multi-site trials. And that's when FDA will um, at some point after that be presented with that data and then, uh, you know, make a determination. So I'd say we're at least probably two to three years away as a conservative estimate. And it could be longer than that, just depending on the timeline. You know, one of the challenges with this kind of work is funding and, and having the resources and, and frankly, getting people to volunteer. You know, you, you, it's, you know, it still is an experimental treatment. There's a lot of people that, that are concerned about the fact that it's still experimental. And so, you know, trying to get people into the study is still something that, uh, that we have to do. Yeah. Hmm. Um, how many more people need to get into the studies you're running? Like how much more of this portion of the work needs to be done? Or is it pretty clear that the psilocybin is having a major effect positively? So the first step of this multi-site trial that's getting started here uh, here this month, actually, uh, is going to enroll 56 people across seven sites. Now, to get to that 56 people, we're probably going to have to screen and go through kind of an assessment process for maybe upwards of a thousand or more, maybe even 1,500 people in order to get to to get to that that number. Uh, and then there'll have oh, wow. to be a second multi-site trial that will have to probably screen many thousands of people to get several hundred people that have gone through the study. So it's definitely an, a, a long you know, road over the next couple of years, but luckily there's a group of people in Wisconsin who are managing the multi-site trial across all the sites, and they're, they're backing um, through financial effort as well as uh, clinical oversight to help make sure that this uh, moves through the process as quickly as possible. Hmm. Interesting. Um, any other substances that you're going to be testing, or is psilocybin enough, or is there variation in psilocybin, uh, certain kinds are fundamentally different from one another and they work better or don't work as well? So there's only one type of uh, synthetic psilocybin, and that's what we primarily use for these studies, although there are efforts looking at MDMA as an adjunct to therapy for PTSD, and actually those studies are a little bit further along. So they are already in well on their way to um, finishing their multi-site trials uh, to determine whether that can be approved, and FDA has also given that breakthrough therapy status. So it's actually more likely that the FDA might uh, approve MDMA for the treatment of PTSD before we have the evidence for psilocybin. Uh, and if that happens, if that does get approved, that actually might open the door and, will, and pave the way for uh, several, uh, making it a little bit easier for psilocybin, especially depending on what the DEA decides to do if FDA makes it available. What about the mechanism by which it acts? Any insight into that? So with psilocybin, you know, we know that it has action on this neurotransmitter in the brain called serotonin. And serotonin is really important because that's the chemical in the brain that regulates things like mood and uh, appetite and sleep. And what we know about depression is that, you know, those are some of the main areas that are affected. So obviously negative mood, uh, decreased or increased appetite, and a lot of sleep disruption. And so it doesn't seem to, you know, outside of, you know, just kind of, you know, logical conclusion that that because psilocybin affects that neurochemical um, that we're seeing some of the, the positive effects. But what we also know is that psilocybin has effects on lots of different parts of the brain that might also be responsible. And in fact, the reason why it may be better than other traditional medications is because it doesn't just affect the serotonin system. It affects other systems and it comes along with, you know, like I mentioned, about 12 to 14 hours of psychotherapy. Um, what we know about regular treatments for depression is that usually it's the combination of therapy and medication that has the best out likelihood of an, a positive outcome. And so that's certainly a piece of the puzzle with this treatment as well. And so you're using a synthetic form of the psilocybin. You, you're not using the native mushroom itself ground up. Correct. That's true. So we're using a, a chemical that was made in a laboratory. But it, why? Because you, people think it might, or you think maybe it would compound the study if you use just ground up mushrooms, or is there another reason? Well, as you might imagine, you know, the FDA doesn't produce medications that are, you know, a plant. Um, and so the medications have to be tightly controlled. They have to be dosed. We have to understand specific dosing and purity about that specific molecule and compound. And the only way to do that reliably and across different people and different studies and different locations is to use a synthetic drug. Hmm. Okay. I was just wondering why. Mm -hmm. Huh, that's interesting. So, yeah, I'm not sure, I guess, quite what else to ask about it. Are there, are there I mean, are there s certain forms of depression that you've encountered where the person has different effects than, you know, 
I mean, negative effects or effects that are just different or unusual than the, you know, the, the clearance of the depression? One thing I'll say is that we, I don't, we, the team, but I also don't believe that this is a magic bullet. This is not going to solve depression for every person. And we've seen that even in our studies, even though so many people are getting better, there are some people who don't get better. And we think that one of those reasons is that how long they've been living with depression. So some of our folks in the study, you know, have had depression for 40 or 50 years, and they've been on lots of uh, standard treatments, lots of standard medications. And even though, you know, we think this treatment is pretty powerful, it might be the case that only two doses uh, is not enough to help people like that. And so some of our people who are in that group um, have not had as strong of a treatment effect. And so, uh, you know, it might be that someday when this is in clinical practice that, you know, people might need four or five sessions over the course of a year before they really get the full um, effect, especially if they've been dealing with depression for a very long time. What about uh, other conditions, you know, maybe brain related? You know, I, I don't know, maybe this is way too far afield, but dementia, Alzheimer's, things like that. Or is it plenty enough to stick with just depression and even like schizophrenia is too far afield? So in the, uh, in the next couple of years, we're starting uh, five new clinical trials at, at the center at Hopkins. And one of them is going to be for Alzheimer's patients. We have another one for Lyme disease oh. patients another one for people with anorexia, and also PTSD. And these studies are all um, getting started because of the funding that we've received to, to open up this center. And we think that uh, psilocybin treatment might have what we call a transdiagnostic effect across conditions, meaning that most of our treatments are treating the symptoms of these problems, but they don't actually get to the underlining reasons and causes for why people have these problems to begin with. And it's possible that psilocybin uh, therapy actually actually gets to this deeper level of what's creating these types of problems. And if that's true, if we keep seeing these positive effects across different types of conditions and different types of studies, um, then it might provide more evidence to confirm that uh, hypothesis. So I guess maybe one of the nice things is that as long as this works, um, understanding the mechanism by which it works is not necessarily necessary, right, for approval. By FDA. It's it's not necessary for approval by FDA, but it is a question that will is is a big part of the types of studies that we're designing. So that's one of the reasons why we do the neuroimaging. It's one of the reasons why we you know we do a lot of uh, questionnaires is because we're trying to do our best to understand that mechanism. But you know to fully do that, we would need you know a lot more money and a lot more resources <laughs> to to get at all of those questions. Oh, have you done neuroimaging on these patients? And uh, if so, what have you seen? Yeah, so for the depression trial that we're just wrapping up, uh, in 24 patients, uh, we gave them uh, fMRI neuroimaging before the session, uh, their first session, and we also gave it to them after their second session. So really look at pre, post, are there any differences in brain functioning before psilocybin uh, to after? Uh, the, re the region that we were primarily interested in was the amygdala, and the amygdala is the part of the brain that responds to emotional cues in the environment. So for example, with depression, we know that the amygdala is more likely to respond to negative emotions that people come into contact with and to kind of perseverate on those emotions. So people are more likely to, to see negative things and to focus on those negative things as opposed to positive things. And that not only kind of maintains depression because people are only seeing and and really reacting to, to negative things in their environment. Um, but it can also potentially be a reason why they got depressed to begin with. And so what's interesting is that in this part of the brain, what we saw with this treatment is that their response to that negative emotional cues uh, in the amygdala decreased after treatment, which means that the amygdala, this region of the brain, was less likely to pick up on those negative cues as it was pre-treatment, which points uh, to a pretty strong indicator of one of the potential mechanisms of this treatment. Well, did you see any change in like the morphology or the size of the amygdala or the blood flow or uh, the chemistry of it somehow, if you're able to look that way? Uh, so that goes a little bit outside of my expertise. Uh, we do have a neuroscientist on the team who has been looking at those, you know, kind of deeper, fine-grained details, but I don't have that information yet. Hmm. Okay. And I guess, is it, it so if you're looking at an fMRI, is it obvious? Have you, have you been able to look at the fMRIs or, again, is that not your area? 
Well, I've been able to look at the the data, which isn't which is kind of comes out in you know numbers and sequences, mm-hmm. and then we use that data to correlate it to other data. Um, but I haven't, you know, the the actual images of the brain, at least to me, is kind of the on the on the research or on the data analysis end, you know, is not something that that I've looked at. Okay, all right. Well, very good. So, how can people uh, follow along with what uh, what you're doing, all the clinical trials, and, and get more info and maybe even try to be a part of one of the trials? Like how can they uh, take the next step? So we have a website, hopkinspsychedelic.org, and people can sign up for our newsletter. And in that newsletter, we will post things like new studies that are coming up, ways to participate if people are interested in screening for a study. We'll also be uh, hiring for quite a few jobs in this new center, and we'll post a lot of those updates uh, via that newsletter. So people can learn more at hopkinspsychedelic.org. Okay, excellent. Well, Alan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, and it's uh, super important work you guys are doing. It's going to help a lot of people, hopefully, so uh, thank you for doing what you do. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.